welcome to the British Library and to Unfinished Business, the new exhibition. It's here, it's happening. It's here at last. Um, my name's Bea Rolat, I work in the cultural events team and uh, we're really excited to be kicking off with this next event, which is an exploration of how Africa is represented in education, art and literature. And it's in association with the Black Curriculum and Myriad Editions. Um, a little bit of what we like to call housekeeping now. If you look below this box, you can see that there's a, a section for questions. You can send those in at any time. Above me here is a feedback section. We'd love to hear what you think. Also, you can buy books and you can donate to the British Library, which would be very nice. Um, the chair for today's panel is Lavinia Stennett a writer, historian and the founder of the Black Curriculum, a social enterprise set up to address the lack of black history in the UK curriculum. So I'm going to hand over to you now, Lavinia. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to New Daughters of Africa. Tonight, we're joined by contributors Annie, Ade, Goretti and Zakiswa. So let's just dive right into it. I'm going to introduce everyone on the panel. Good evening. How is everyone doing? Good evening. Hi. Good, evening. good, good. So um, this is the, the, I guess, the penultimate day before uh, the, the light changes. So we want to be able to kind of bring the light in into this conversation um, and share yeah. warmth and also the education around New Daughters of Africa. So um, today, Margaret, ba Margaret Busby's landmark anthology is the epitome of intergenerational sisterhood and has provided us with foundations for a remarkable conversation surrounding race, gender and resistance. With, Bug with Busby's legacy, it is immortalized by continuing to push the conversation forward and for us as readers to continue to celebrate her work and the generous gift to the world. So first, I'm going to introduce Annie. Annie is an actress, director, and writer. Annie, can you give everyone a wave? Hi. <laughs> and uh, she has worked in radio, TV, and films, and theatre. She appeared earlier this year in Inua LM's Three Sisters at the National Theatre. She is currently lecturing at St Mary's University in Twickenham and is directing students at RADA. Annie's poems and short stories are published in various anthologies and her plays produced in the UK. She has just finished her novel, Congratulations, Breaking the Martha Chain, which is to be published in 2021. And it was shortlisted for the Lucy Cavendish College Fiction Competition. Um, so quite, quite a lot. And an extract from um, her novel is also um, championed by Myriad Editions in the first novel competition of 2018 and she is also working on her second novel Ominara. So welcome Annie. Hi. I will now hi. on to Goretti. Hi Goretti, how are you? Uh, hi. Hi. Hiya, so Goretti is one of Uganda's leading novelists. She holds an MA in creative writing from the University of KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa. Her first novel, The First Daughter, was published in 1996, followed by Secrets No More in 1999, which won the Uganda National Literary Award for Best Novel in the same year. In 2002, she published a novella, Whispers from Vera. Her third novel, Waiting, was published by the Feminist Press in New York in 20, 2007. In 2014, she published her essential handbook for African creative writers. She has also published several short stories in children's books and um, was recently also appointed um, a member of the Commonwealth Foundation Civil Society um, as part of their governing board. Um, welcome, Goretti. Thank you. So our next contributor is Zakiswa. Zakiswa, hello, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. How are you doing? Great, great, awesome. So Zakiswa is a South African writer, editor, and publisher born in Zambia, raised in Zimbabwe, and currently based in Kenya, but who considers the whole African continent her home. Her debut nov novel, The Madams, was shortlisted for the 20 2007 K-Sello's now you've got to correct me now, Duika Award in 2007. Her third novel, Men of the South was shortlisted for the Commonwealth Writers' Prize, Best Book 2011, and Herman Charles Bosman Award. In 2014, she was named Africa, um, on the Africa 39 list, um, which categorizes 39 sub-Saharan African writers under 40 with the potential and talent to 
define trends in African literature. In 2015, she won the K. Solo Duca Memorial Literary Award in London, Cape Town, Joe Burke, and she has written three children's book, um, children's books. And she's also the founder and curator of Artistic Encounters, the virtual literary events, and also the founder and editor of the Afro Young Adult Anthology. She is the co-founder also of the publishing house, Pai Vapo. And yes, thank you so much. So we are clearly in the presence of greatness. And last but not least, we have Adi. Adi Solanki is an award-winning award -winning British Nigerian playwright, screenwriter and academic. She has an MFA in film from the University of Southern California where she was a Fulbright scholar and uh, she has a BA honors in English literature from Sheffield University. Her award-winning plays include the acclaimed Pandora's Box, which won a Best New Play nomination off the West End. And um, she was shortlisted for the $100,000 Nigerian Prize for Literature, uh, which is Africa's biggest literary award. She's um, also conducted the most recent play, The Court Must Have Had a Queen, which premiered at the Hampton Court Palace in 2018. And she's also written for The Guardian, The New Statesman, Art Monthly, The Times, The Voice, and BBC Radio 4. Wow. So I'm ready to get into these questions. Thank you, everyone. Um, so we'll start with Annie. Um, and Annie, could you tell us more about the depictions of gender in your writing and plays and why it is important that a range of narratives um, are centered? Um, I wrote about both genders, but I must admit that I tend to write more from the female point of view. I think that it's important that as women, we tell our stories ourselves. Most of the time we hear from and about the men and their point of view. And I think that um, women have their stories too. And these are just as important. And uh, um, more and more black women's stories are coming, are being um, uh, shown, being produced, being uh, published. And um, this is what has happened with um, the New Daughters of Africa anthology, where um, Margaret Busby has been able to get over 200 um, black women um, to have their stories told either through poetry or um, sh short stories or extracts like, like mine. Um, my novel, Breaking the Massive Chain, which is based on Sarah Forbes Bonetta, uh, has two female narrators, um, sisters captured during the slave trade. And it was important for me for us to see their different take as women living first in Africa and then later on in Victoria and England where they lived completely different um, lives, um, one as a maid and the other as a princess, the goddaughter of Queen Victoria. It's important for me that um, we learn our history, that children know of our history and that we um, have it available for both the boys and for the girls to feel that uh, they are represented. So uh, my depictions of gender is both, but skewed towards the female gender. Thank you, that was perfect. So thinking about um, breaking the Martha chain, also understanding that our children need to know our histories. Goretti, I'm gonna go over to you and ask you about um, what ways Ugandan politics has influenced your writing and how do you think the two are synonymous? Well, first of all, I, I really think that for us writers, there's definitely a mix of politics and, and writing, mm -hmm. and that the, the act of writing itself is, is, is political. Because if, if you consider why, why we write or, or why, why do I write, it is to express our opinions and through a particular point of view. So that's already an, a, a political act. Because you are not just expressing your opinion, but you are persuading the world to look at it from, from your point of view. Then the other reason is uh, to question or interrogate the, the status quo. So for me, that's already an act of uh, a political act. And, and then there's freedom of expression, which as writers we practice every day. 
it's it's a political act as as a human right. It's ingrained in in, in laws of our countries. So I also regard that as a as a political act. And the themes, if you look at the themes which which we write about, we write about race, about gender, war, inequality, identity, migration, love, sex. You know, even when I look at love and sex, I, I keep thinking that it's the way these two are regulated. So it's not, it's, you are not free to love the person that you really want to. There's a regulation somewhere and you're not free sometimes, you know, to have sex with the, with the person. You know, there, there's some regulation somewhere on these acts. So for me, I regard that as a, as a political act. And, and for my own writing, I write about, you know, all my writing is based on the political realities of my country, which, which is Uganda. I write about war, particularly how devastating, the, the, the devastating effects of war on women. I write about patriarchy, questioning men's privileged position in society. And, and sometimes I feel that I don't really have the, the luxury or the privilege not to write about these issues. Mm -hmm. Wonderful answers. And it's really interesting to, to reflect on the inextricable nature of, of politics from our writing. We can't divorce the two. So um, thinking about themes, um, I want to move on to Zakiswa um, and understand more about your work and how um, your work is particularly informed by African concepts of time. So um, could you tell us more about that? Well, I just, um, there isn't really like anything major to tell about it. It's, it I think the work itself speaks for itself, but um, I'm, 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 I'm genuinely, I think the second part of that question uh, that you're asking was, um, what are the lessons we can use, uh, we can learn by using African ways of understanding the world? And I think the major lesson that one can learn from uh, is, I think in all our communities, wherever we are from, there's a concept of, of humanity, humane, humaneness, Ubuntu, uh, as we'd say in South Africa, or Unu, as we'd say in Shona. And, um, and I think the major thing that we can, we, a lot of us know it, a lot of Africans know it, but perhaps our leaders need to know it. You know, our leaders in, in, in Nigeria, our leaders in, in South Africa, our leaders in Zimbabwe, our leaders in DR Congo, you know, and all over the continent. So perhaps maybe from our literatures, what our leadership could learn. Well, maybe from our literatures, our readers should, should just, our leaders should just read more so that <laughs> they learn humanity and they learn what we know. Absolutely. And I think it couldn't be any more, um, crucial in this society that we have today that our leaders are informed by African ways of seeing the world and um, thank you for also bringing in some Shauna there as well. So um, Adi, I'm going to move to you and um, could you tell us more about some of the pivotal changes that you have seen with Africa on screen? There are lots of changes. The one I'm going to focus on is the increasing the number of protagonists, which is always of interest to me. I made a choice, as Annie has said, in my work, I'll always center African, mainly African female, but African and black African heritage characters. So it's been remarkable that in the last two, three years, there have been, I think, there was one weekend this year when out of all the films released one weekend, there were maybe 10 new releases. And three of them were black films, African films with them, um, black, um, protagonists. And I think it's extremely important that we focus on not just having lots of the talents of Annie's people, the actors on screen, but the roles they're playing. That for me is the paramount issue. Um, in recent times, in the last month, I think we've had the first, well, it's not the first, but a screenplay written, a film with the screenplay written by a British Nigerian, a very young woman, um, Rocks, which came out maybe two, three weeks ago. And that was a coming of age type story, a group of young teenagers in the area I'm speaking to you from, Hackney. I live 10 minutes from Dalston where a lot of the filmmaking was, was done. 
And um, it was really moving to watch a story about young women, the sort of women who we walk past on the streets, I see them on their way to school, to see their lives put on screen. It shouldn't be remarkable, but it actually is a sad measure of our society that it is really still almost headline making. Um, a year ago, another film that I found very moving for a similar reason is we've often seen the trope of the white savior in our African storytelling. And I really enjoyed The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind, the story that um, I think it was Chiwetel Ejiofor directed. Yeah. And that for me is the exact type of story I want to see and write, which is about a black savior story, a young Malawian child who's struggling in his um, community and uses his wits, his, his smarts, his ingenuity to solve a problem. So I'm really excited to see that trend, more and more black protagonists. And we can't have this conversation without talking about the impact. Whatever we think of the whole Wakanda notion of Black Panther, which, you know, was, first of all, a, a really big budget, you know, um, Disney blockbuster, superhero. In terms of genre, it's not the first superhero film, but I think it's an important um, addition to the repertoire of African storytelling that the amount of energy and time and passion and love, and it was a really brilliant work of, of fiction. Um, to see that level of investment in African storytelling is remarkable. And it obviously pays off because the audiences came in droves. It was a huge box office success on the list of the top 10, I think, most highest grossing films in the world. So I think having black protagonists in all sorts of stories, low budget, independent fare, but also Blockbuster fair is a really welcome trend that I'd applaud and want to contribute to. And I think it matters for several reasons. I think as pure entertainment, I've always been very keen on entertainment storytelling, which is about entertaining people. But as some of the other panelists have said, we also do obviously want to educate. And I think when we talk, when I think about the, the horror of George Floyd's murder in, in um, America earlier this year, there is a link between the level and the scale of black protagonists in fiction and the way in which our lives are treated in real life. If we are low value in the fiction chain, if we're never the center, if we're only ever supporting characters or subsidiary characters, that does, I'm not arguing it, it makes all the difference, but it feeds into the way we're, if you like, evaluated and treated in real life. So I think African protagonists are really important and the lack of them in the past has devalued our lives and the increase of them is helping to not just tell our stories, entertain and make money for film companies and studios, but it's also contributing to a, a better society. I genuinely believe that. And by the way, obviously we all know what the protagonist, but just we do, but for the, the audience, it's the person who is the beating heart of the story. It's the, the person, and it's often the white male who is 20 feet tall, James Bond on the screen. And this is the person who holds our attention for two hours or three hours, whatever it is, or 13 episodes if it's a TV series or 20 episodes. So you can see the importance of us valuing ourselves and putting ourselves, as we do as writers, into the heart of our own storytelling and sharing our important in that role with the rest of the audience. And in fact, you know, so often when we talk about the white savior trope, they're always, I always think, descendants of Tarzan, you know, the idea of the yeah. king of the jungle is a white guy. Yeah. So thank God we're seeing Africa not just as a backdrop for these kinds of, you know, different white stories, but Nollywood has been a massive contributor to countering that. We mustn't forget, because I live in the West, I may always focus on Euro and American stories, but Nollywood has done an amass amazing job in obviously centering black stories. I've contributed to Nor Nollywood. Nobody blinks at the idea of a black protagonist. What wonderful reflections. I think it's really important that we have a range of, of narratives and um, we're at the heart of that in terms of storytelling, as you say, um, particularly with black protagonists inside the continent, also outside of that as well. So thank you, Ellie, for your contributions. Um, it's a perfect segue back to Annie. So Annie, could you tell us more on how you direct your work to navigate past linear narratives of loss, um, when showcasing the complexity of African cultures and histories? Um, the linear, linear narratives present stories in a, in a logical manner, you know, by telling what happened from one point to the next in, in time. It, it goes in the straight line. But 
most of the time, our stories, ourselves, go backwards and forwards. So um, African culture and histories are complex and uh, they're embedded in our very being. So when I'm writing a story that's based uh, uh, with African um, uh, uh, or black characters, their lives are not linear, their stories are not linear. So I, it, it becomes um, part of a non-linear narrative that goes backwards and forwards and does some flashbacks and it has memories. Our memories, are we, ha we still have our ancestral traumas within us, but um, as we grow, as our children grow up in the diaspora, we, they are forgetting some of those memories. They, they, they don't share as many. So through our writing, through our stories, we have to tell them some of those stories, which means that even if the, if the story is based on the present day, we have to go back and bring in some of our traditions, um, the things that we eat. When I'm writing, um, even though I'm writing in England, I tap into the memories that I have of being in Africa, of feeling the sun on me, of the smells, of, of the stories that my grandmother gave me, and of the losses. We are filled with the losses of our, uh, of our ancestors. And you know, when, when we go into things like Black Lives Matter, it does matter because up until 2015, the government was paying uh, from our taxes um, to the people who um, were rep recompensed for their slaves. So it's not something that's passed. When, they, when, when um, George Floyd's knee, uh, um, the uh, policeman knelt on George Floyd's neck, it reminds us of the things that happened to our ancestors. It's not, it's not um, so far away that we, we don't feel it within us. When our sons walk down the street and they have to, if they have a hoodie, they're going to be stopped and you're told, where, uh, um, uh, um, where are you going? Because you're in an, a good area. All of these things uh, go back to the memories that we have of our ancestors. So it's not, our stories are not linear. They are non-linear. They have to go backwards and forwards and we have to see where we are going and to uh, rejoice in the things that are changing, but not enough of it is changing. Uh, so, uh, I just feel that it's imperative that we teach our children uh, and uh, adults. Uh, I, I don't believe in Black History Month. Our history is all year round and it's not Black history because our history is white history. They came to Africa and took our people so, and the riches that they have come from that. So our stories intermingle and they go backwards and forwards. So um, when I'm when I'm writing, I want to showcase that complexity of the culture and the histories and how it, it, it goes backwards and forwards to the present day. That was beautifully put. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think it's really key, um, that insight that we have um, to sustain that cultural imagination um, as well as memory um, through kind of thinking about storytelling um, and also narratives around cultural history that go backwards and forwards. So thank you very much. Um, so Goretti, this is really interesting because you've just spoken about passing on that legacy towards young people. So how are you currently working with young writers through your platform to extend their imaginative expressions of Africa in their representations? Well, my, my, my platform at the moment is the African Writers Trust. So this is the organization that I founded in 2009. And basically the idea behind African Writers Trust is to bring together and connect African writers and publishing professionals in the diaspora and those on the continent. So we do this through trainings, mentorship, we run an international writers workshop, I mean conference every two years and we also run creative writing and publishing and editing workshops. So we work with young writers across the board. We work with writers who are focusing to develop their craft to higher standards or those who want to self-publish their, their, their works. We also work with writers who want to develop a career in the industry. 
Because in, in Africa, it's so difficult to draw the line between who the writer is, who the editor is, who the publisher is, who the, who the marketer is. It's usually one person wearing all those hats. So we work with all these writers who want to do different things with, with their craft. And from my experience, you know, there is an abundance of, of stories. There's no shortage of, of stories on the continent and talent and, and basic skill. The, the, the main issue is the, the lack of, of the input of a professional book editor or publisher. So, so the, the stories are on one hand, but, but who, who, who comes to, to develop them to competitive levels? You know, to cross the T's and dot the I's, as they say, that that is what is generally lacking. There's a critical short shortage of professional book editors on the continent. So how we usually address that is to invite the experts in the industry to come and, and mentor and run these editing and publishing workshops and work with these young writers. So in the past 10 years, we've worked with the Ella Wakatama, I'm sure he's known to, to, to many of us. We've also invited Margaret Busby. She was in Uganda in 2016 to, to run a, a, a writing, I mean, a, an editing and publishing workshop and also to, to mentor. And, and as you say, to, to try and, 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 you know, extend the, the, the imaginative uh, vision of, of these young people so, so the connection between the writers from the diaspora and the writers on the continent, I, I believe has, has, has contributed to, to, to expand that imaginative vision of the writers who remain on the continent. I should also mention that we've also worked with Jacob Ross, originally from Grenada. So, so that's, how, that's what we've been focusing on. Thank you very much, Goretti. So there's a cross territorial exchange there with um, mentors for young writers. And um, for those that didn't catch the platform, the platform is African Writers Trust and that's African Writers Trust and you can find that online. So moving over, thank you very much, Goretti, to Zakiswa. We want to know more about your work, particularly made in SA. So that's South Africa. Uh, local expressions appear in the dialogue of your work quite a lot. Um, how can other writers showcase the complexity of language in their work? What advice do you have? Language, firstly, may I just say to Annie how much I absolutely enjoyed reading your excerpt and I'm looking forward to your book. I just Thank needed you. to say that, just a fun girl. But um, regarding language, um, I've, always been, I've always been fascinated with language and I always try to play around with it. And... Uh, the reason I write and the reason I read is I read to entertain, but also to, to, to educate. So I like it when, when people read my work and they're able to place themselves, they're, they're able to maybe not understand that particular word, but if it's put contextually, they can get it. But there are also certain things that are so, so quintessentially African that um, I enjoy using them in language. For instance, in, in a lot of our countries, we have the expression, um, we, 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 never, we never walk uh, a lot. We walk and walk and walk and walk. And I like the idea of that. I like the idea of hearing the smell. We know what hearing the smell means, you know, because of the senses. So um, I am constantly with language, um, perhaps just always trying to to reimagine and center, because so often we've centered, we've centered whiteness, we've centered the West. I'm so often trying to center us, to say our stories matter, but how we speak, our language also matters, who we are. So uh, I was talking to a friend and I said, my characters, I never mentioned that I have, somebody is black in a book because I'm black. So that is the center. Um, but I might mention that somebody is white because that's the other in my world, you know? So, yeah, so it's just the needing to, to center yourself, to center your humanity. Um, I was telling somebody at some point in time that they did a, re they did a review of my first novel and um, the white South African woman and they stayed, um, Dugu Savannah is the first black woman chick 
lit writer. So there are all these compartmentalizations and, and, and I wasn't very happy with that. And, they, and she didn't understand why I was unhappy with it. And I was like, listen, you live in a country that's 52% uh, women and um, that's, um, you know, 90% black. So, you know, I'm not the other, I am, I am the center, you know? Um, but most also because you, you, you actually don't have dick lit as a, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a category of literature, you know, but you have chick lit. And so it's very interesting to, to figure that out, but yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much for reminding us of how to center ourselves and our humanity in our work. Um, and we are slowly kind of running out of time, but we will walk and walk and walk until um, we can then get more information from some of the other panelists with their questions. So one of the questions I actually have for Addy now is kind of around centering that humanity. So the theme of migration is interwoven throughout Pandora's box and some of your other work. Can you walk us through how this informs identity and the theme of identity in your work? Well, as far as I'm concerned, every single story is about identity. I don't know why the label is attached more to work by black people, African people, women, etc. When, you know, a Russian novelist or a French novelist writes about their heritage and their experience, that's identity. So I've got no problem with writing identity. I just wish we'd be aware, more aware that every, every story is an element, an expression of identity. So I've always, the opposite of um, my sister from South Africa, I've always lived in the West and I've always been what's been designated a minority, but I've never felt that. I've always been conscious of being part of a global majority. And even if numerically in England, I grew up in West London, Notting Hill, even if in England we were a, num a numerical minority. In Labrook Grove, I wasn't actually aware that we were a minority. I know it sounds ridiculous, but there was such a, a, a world. We lived in the world. There were people from everywhere and it didn't, it was actually only when I went to university where there was a numerical, black people were a numerical majority. So my work has always explored being African in the diaspora and Pandora's Box was my first play. And it addressed a particular aspect of that diaspora experience, which is, you know, the agonies and ecstasies of raising children in the diaspora. You want to connect to your home and your, your cultural family and world and country. And you're also part of this country and what sorts of creative tensions does that throw up? So for me, it's, it's like my life. I don't imagine I can write any story. I could, I've been commissioned to write stories which don't deal with identity and diaspora. But in terms of my experience, it's so central. The idea of always, you know, suitcase is always ready in the sense that my mother was always saying, oh, I'm gonna go back to Nigeria. So we always had this sense of being permanently temporary. I wouldn't actually say that's necessarily a good thing, but it's a part of my experience, which is so part of my, my life that, it's integral. So in Pandora's box, it's a mother who's wrestling with whether or not to take her British born, and she's also British born child. She's wrestling about the choice about taking him back to school in Africa, which as we all know, many African parents in the diaspora do this. If the child is having trouble, as often young males sometimes run a cropper in this society for reasons we needn't go into here. So it was, it was a story which was inspired by a friend of mine. And I was quite amazed to the, at the extent to which it really connected with Asian audiences, with you know, Eastern European audiences. It was quite a universal diaspora story. How do we raise our young in a foreign land? Even though it's the home country of the mother, it's still in the sense her second country. So I think it's for African heritage writers and many of the books, many of the pieces, the extracts in Margaret's book speak to this experience of diaspora because we're global citizens and wherever we find ourself, ourselves positioned, we're always looking to Africa because it's our, our homeland in, 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 in lots of ways, even if we never lived there. I've never lived on the continent of Africa. I've worked in Africa. I've contributed to lots of African projects, but I've always lived in either England and for a while in America. So yeah, the idea of migration. And I also think a lot about what will my son's children and his children be like? That's something I'm beginning to think about in terms of the kinds of stories of diaspora. They needn't just be about now. What will the future of our diaspora be? I think those are interesting um, areas to explore too. Definitely. I think our young ones definitely need to start thinking about that themselves as well. Um, and that phrase that you mentioned, 
permanently temporary resonated very deeply mm. um and some of the work the black curriculum does it really kind of grapples with those themes of identity so thank you for drawing our attention back to the fact that everyone experiences that as well um i'm going to come back actually to goretti um and i want to know from you how optimism shapes your work I think if I remember correctly, it was Desmond Tutu, Bishop Desmond Tutu, who once said that we have to be prisoners of hope. Mm. And, and, and I think, I've, you know, whenever I'm doing my work, it, it keeps coming back to me because giving up is the easier option. I've, I've worked on the continent. I've been uh, promoting literature and, and African writers for the past over 20 years. And Every time I think about giving up, I always come back to that. We, we, we have to keep up the, the hope. We have to be optimistic. Mm. Uh, I, I, but at the same time, I, I want to believe that things are much better now than when I first published my, my first novel, which was in 1996. There mm. were virtually no support structures for writers. There was no, the, the publisher who published me was the only publishing house in Uganda. And now when I look through the past 15 or so years, there are really a number of literary and publishing initiatives that have come up on the continent. I can just mention a few. There's a, the Ake Festival in Nigeria, Hageisa in Somaliland. There's a, a Banto in South Africa. And then the Uganda International Writers Conference, which I, I organize in Uganda every two years. There's Who's a Press in, in Rwanda, we you know Cassava Republic Press in, in Nigeria. So I, I think things are beginning to look a little much better than they were about 20 to 25 years ago. But I also look around and, and, and think that some things have actually remained the same in the past 20 odd years that I've been doing this work. Because so most of these initiatives that I mentioned, they are almost all of them are donor driven, which indeed is a, a threat on, on, on its, on, in, in itself. And, and there's still virtually no support or very minimal support for, for arts, which is and still a, a struggle as it was for me 20 years ago to raise the, the funds I need to, to run my work. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much. So whilst there is, I guess, a sense of things changing, there is still a lot of futility and instability with the structures that support writers. Um, and I think, yeah, that's really, that's really crucial in, in terms of the work that we're putting out and, and what that means for our society. So um, I want to move actually back to Zakiswa um, to actually understand within the society that we're speaking about, what are some of the successes that you witnessed in writing and depicting polygamy? I've never written about polygamy, but, <laughs> and I don't know about any successes in depicting it. Heck, my country's biggest polygamist um, or most famous, Jacob Zuma, probably can't tell you of any successes in polygamy if you look at his life. So no, I don't know. Okay. All right, well, thank you for that. I think one of the things that we um, want to move forward in thinking about is inspiration. So if you could touch on some of the inspirations around your work, um, that would be really good for some of the panelists um, to hear and also the audiences as well. Well, certainly uh, Amar Taidu has been a, a big influence on me, her, um, her outlook on the con on the continent and the diaspora, her pan-Africanism, her, her feminism. Uh, Maurice Conde is another very important uh, literary figure to me. Um, and then there are people like uh, Zex Mda, who is immensely generous. He reads, he comes, you know, he engages with your work in a very generous, generous way. So uh, yeah, I've, I've, I've been very lucky. And of course, uh, well, Margaret Basley, you know, uh, she is one of my major inspirations when I started setting up my, my publishing house because I loved, loved, loved what she did when she had Alison and Basby, you know, one of the most memorable books. And I watched this movie at least 
twice, twice, you know, three times a year. Um, and I read the book just as often. Um, the Spook Who Said by the Door, which was the first book that she published. So yeah, but yeah, I'm I'm very lucky. Every 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 woman and every man, most most writers that I've encountered have shaped me in 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 some ways. You know, the the amazing writers have made me want to become a better writer, and the terrible ones have made me learn how not to be a writer. So <laughs> I guess you learn from both. Thank you, thank mm -hmm. you very much as well. Um, Emma Atta, I do, Margaret Barsby are inspirational, very inspirational. And um, Addy, if you could tell us more about um, Phyllis in London, which is a story that you wrote, um, why have you focused on cross-national narratives about black people and why is that important to you? Um, I think you have mentioned before about um, the, the expression of identity and black protagonists, but thinking about America specifically, how um, are those narratives also very important as well? Well, Phyllis is a, a project I've been working on for several years and I've got a feeling I'll do the play in a couple of years and I may do a screen version of it. And there are all sorts of ways to tell her story. Uh, for those who don't know, Phyllis Wheatley was an American, an African-American enslaved woman who came to this country in 1773 to publish the first book of poetry by an African in English. I always stress it was the first book in English, not the first book written by an, Ang an African. Obviously we have African languages and books were published. Um, but 1773 is a moment, a landmark in British literary history, American literary history, African liter literary history from that point of view. And she's fascinating to me as a diaspora writer because she came to London because although she was born in Africa and kidnapped from there, trafficked to America and enslaved, she was heralded as a prodigy and celebrated while she was still enslaved and came to England because for, what, for lots of reasons, uh, she wouldn't, they wouldn't publish her in America. I studied as a writer in America myself several years ago. So, you know, 30 years ago, I was not in the same position. Obviously I wasn't enslaved, but I was a, an African writer abroad. And she came here to do a publicity tour of her work. I know it does sound really contradictory. How can you be enslaved? How can you be a celebrity? How can you be a prodigy? But this is all the madness of what slavery really was. Of course, people who were genius before they were enslaved, didn't just, it didn't just evaporate. So um, her story is one that fascinates me from that point of view. Obviously as an African woman writer in English, she's one of the mothers of my, of, in my writing tradition. And also I'm interested in her because it's a way to explore this question, which has been central to my work how far do we embrace our trauma and tell our trauma and dramatize it? I think struggle isn't all our history is about, but it's a key part, at least in our encounter with the West. And I think the struggle has given us as African people really extraordinary narratives, but we don't want just trauma narratives. So we often hear people, especially around films like 12 Years a Slave, oh, we don't wanna hear any more slave stories. And I really fundamentally disagree with that. I don't think stories about racism are depressing and, de and un unempowering in of themselves, it's how they're told. I think we can tell stories about enslaved people, which are tales of resistance and resilience and overcoming of all the obstacles that are in, you know, obviously there. And I also think something much more fundamental. I don't think there's ever has been, there's ever been any shame in having been a slave. And we shouldn't, I certainly don't feel it's our, well, fault is the obvious word. And so the sense of shame that we sometimes exhibit when these um, stories about enslaved people come up is unnecessary. I like stories about the past because as in the case of the Phyllis Wheatley story, they really teach me about today. I actually couldn't understand certain things that happened in contemporary life until I began researching and exploring Phyllis's story. And then it was like, oh, hey presto, now I get it. I actually understood my times and the place and time I find myself in by going back to the, the, the depths of slavery, you know, the 1770s, slavery was at its height and it illuminated my life today. As in, Phyllis wasn't published in America because it, it wasn't what a black person was supposed to do. They knew she'd written the books, they tested her, they knew she had the talent, but they just thought, oh no, it's not right. And doesn't that feed into some of the experiences we have in the West today? Certain things that are deemed not right for black people to be doing is still a feature of our lives. 
Very powerful. Um, and thinking about Phyllis's story, as well as um, the linear narratives that we spoke about earlier, Annie, what are your hopes for the future of British theatre? Oh, well, British theatre at the moment is um, in difficulties, shall we say, because of the pandemic. We are not, um, uh, there's no theatre that's open properly. The, they're just starting. I mean, I am so looking forward to next weekend going to the National Theatre to see um, a Death of England by Roy Williams and Clint Dyer, Dwyer, because it's sort of saying we have a future, but our future is going to be very different to the future that we have now. Um, I don't suppose that we're going to go back to the kind of lifestyle that we had before. You know, I think that it's going to be um, that we are so lucky in a way that we have the internet. The young have um, the ability to do things that my generation would have been stymied if this had happened um, 30, 40 years ago. Um, we have means of sort of um, looking for different ways of bringing theater and the arts. Um, at the moment, I'm, I'm directing um, a Zoom play of Wele Shayinka, um, Death, of the, uh, Death of the King's Horseman, which is on, 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 on Sunday. And um, the ability to have a cast from different parts of the country to come together and to rehearse and to perform means that there is some hope. There have been lots of short plays and things that have been done um, from people's homes and from small studios. This whole thing of doing um, sort of um, the socially distanced theater is, is working for, for a lot of people. I went to see something that the Stratford East Theater were putting on and it was done on, in a basketball court. Of course, in the winter, we can't do that. But we're being adventurous and we're being innovative and there's hope. I, mean, I don't think that we'll have the theater that we had before for a long time. I don't see that the West End with the visitors from um, all over the world coming to see our shows is going to happen. But I think that smaller theatres are, are going to happen. We needed, we saw what happened when we first went into lockdown and how um, our uh, all the things that were filmed were sort of gobbled up in no time at all. We see how uh, um, some of the shows that were just videoed for posterity are being shown. And we, we see them. Of course, when it first, uh, when we first went into lockdown, it was, um, they showed a lot of things for free, um, which is fine. But now, thank God, they're beginning to charge for it so that people who can take part in it can be paid. Because we, uh, a lot of us are not having any funds. Either way, we're not furloughed. We some of us can't claim universal benefits and so on. And it's not just the actors. It's the stage hand, it's the costume people, the, 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 the makeup and so on that makes up the theater. It's the restaurants around the theater and so on. We're all in a difficult position and we're just hoping that um, things will change, but it will never get back to what it was. It might come back and it might be going, we might have it going parallel so that you have some of the things online as well as the uh, um, live theater. But live theatre in some form will, will be there, but it is very difficult and a lot of people are suffering and a lot of people will, will be out of work and they might try to do what we were told we were supposed to do, go and find and train for other jobs. Where are these other jobs? <laughs> you know, there are no other jobs. Um, and people will want entertainment. They do want music. They do want um, theatre because it, it's, it's good for our mental stability. So we are, we are essential workers in a lot of ways. And uh, please God, <laughs> let the theater continue and music continue and a live theater. Absolutely. I think it's, yeah, really, really interesting that we've just reflected on a reality of precarity and um, we just don't know what's gonna happen in the future. But at the moment we have such wonderful uh, um, contributions from you all um, and also a reminder that um, people will come to listen to, to, to education um, and to ways in which we can um, think about the world um, to represent 
um, black people and black contributions to the world in a better light. So thank you very much for your contributions. We have about seven minutes for questions. So to the audience, please submit all your questions using the question form to our wonderful panelists. And um, yeah, we'll be able to take them. So uh, you can use the question feed and I will be able to read them out. So we have one question. Um, so when you're writing your questions, if you could pose it to um, one of the panelists, that'd be really helpful. Um, but I'm gonna pose this one to everyone. So how can we use online resources to benefit black history and learning? Are there free platforms we can access with our children in our schools? And where can we go to hear those oral histories and stories Annie discusses? So I'll leave that for everyone. If we can um, respond in two minutes, under two minutes, so that we can get other questions in, that would be great. So that is online resources. I think you're the one uh, with your work as the, your, the work you do as a black curriculum. You're the answer to you have the answer. <laughs> you're the expert. We'll, so hand, this, we'll hand that over to you, Lavinia. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, I'll join you all. Um, some of the, the online resources include animations that you can find on YouTube. Um, there are also an array of videos on YouTube as well that document the experiences of black people in Britain um, in the early 1900s and also the early 20th century too. And I think it's really important to start with um, visual elements as well as kind of books as well. Um, there are a number of courses um, that you can take online um, available under Black History. I think it's Black History Walks and also by Robin Walker, who is now offering online courses as well um, for, yeah, for everyone to kind of educate themselves on Black History. Um, Instagram is a great learning tool. I think we've all seen over the course of the pandemic, everyone's sharing loads of these infographics and like how to be anti-racist, how to learn about this. Um, so you can um, access not only archives, but also information on Instagram. A few of the accounts that I know of are black in the day. Um, there is also um, another page called Free Black Uni, which are doing an amazing, amazing job at the moment in kind of boarding, boarding it out. But I'm not gonna spend too much time discussing that. Um, can I would suggest people go to your website because that would be an absolute treasure trove, I imagine. <laughs> Yes, You're being definitely. too humble. <laughs> so the Black Curriculum um, is a website that you can check out, theblackcurriculum.com. And we have an array of um, resources that we will be developing over the next couple of months that include um, Black British history. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Addy, for the shout out. <laughs> cool. So are there any other questions? Currently, we are having um problems and getting questions in don't be shy people i can um, quickly just comment on one thing that's interesting in terms of the stage i've been thinking about this for a long time just connected to the issue of black protagonists i'd love to hear annie's thoughts i really relish any opportunity to see wonderful actors in any role um but i often worry about sometimes the thing that's called colorblind casting maybe detracting from original new material which is if you like about african subjects and stories so if there's no question coming through that's something i think we should also think about in this whole in the concept in the context of this conversation about african representation when you put a black body on stage in the form of actors like annie of the caliber of annie and they're doing a role which is wonderful and they're doing a great job i think of papa esidu when he did um hamlet extraordinary performance i think hamlet for me has never been performed so brilliantly and I've seen about 30 or 40 productions but the question still remains what happens when that body is emptied of its own history and heritage? I, I, I'd like to just say something about that I think that we have for too long um, bowed down to black um, American plays we have so many very good black um, British writers and unless their, unless their plays are, are done we will not become part of the canon and we will have to keep falling back on other things. I love Shakespeare. I teach Shakespeare and I think it's fine for us to look and at I love Shakespeare story, too, absolutely. But I think that for us to represent ourselves and where we stand as black British in England is, is vital for um, young people to come and see themselves. Um, when we did um, Three Sisters, although it was based on uh, Chekhov's Three Sisters, the fact that it was moved to Biafra 
the number of people who came and then brought their parents or brought their children because they were learning about Biafra and about the history of um, the connection between Biafra and England, Biafra and the rest of the world. And it was absolutely amazing to some people to come on, to go to the theater and see 18 black people on, on, on stage, all, all British and representing some uh, um, British and black history. I see Lavinia wants to say something. I'm just going to come in because all the questions started coming in. So a question for Annie quickly, you have two minutes. Um, yeah. Where can you watch the Wallace Inc. production this coming Sunday? And another question that for all the panelists, um, where is the best place to start when exploring African female writers and who are the must reads? Okay, um, the, the Zoom thing is on Utopia, Utopia Theatre. If you go to their website, you can see how to um, get a ticket for Sunday. It's Sunday at 4.30, Woloshe Inka, um, uh, Death of the uh, King's Horseman that I directed with Mojisola. Talking about where they can get about uh, black uh, uh, female writers, they can go to, there's some anthologies that will give you an idea of what um, plays they are. And then you can, from that, you can get to some of the um, female writers. But there are people like Winsome Pinnock. There's a, a day um, here. There, there, are, there are Paulette Randall. There are, there's so many of them. I could uh, give a whole list, but go online and, and find out. There's actually, the National Theatre has something called Black Theatre Online, which is a portal. So that also is a good resource. Yeah. And I can see you just of Africa, Africa is a fantastic yeah. resource, and so is Obviously. the Daughters of Africa, which is the original. <laughs> so you get New Daughters of Africa. This is an amazing resource to start with, yeah. and um, and I have been doing uh, as, as as doing since since March uh, an online lit fest, a virtual lit fest, as a response to the pandemic called Afro Lit Sense Frontiers. And it's got writers in, in, in English and, and in Portuguese and in French from all over the, 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 the black world, whether it's Brazil or, you know, uh, Angola or Cameroon or, you know, just all over. So that's another place you can just check it out on www.afrolitsandfrontiers.com. Thank you. And you'll so see a lot of women writers. Thank you. One more question from the Margaret Busby. So she said what she wanted to say, thank you all for, for your wonderful contributions to the anthology. How do you all feel about having helped the book to happen in collaboration with Myriad Editions who have put on this amazing event with the British Library and SOAS um, and enabling one student from Africa to have a free course of study? How does it feel? 30 seconds, 10 seconds each. I think it's just so wonderful because Everything we're doing in the anthology, with this talk, with the work Jonah and the other, the team at the British Library, with what you're doing at the Black Curriculum, all of us, we're saying Black lives matter in our own different ways. Black women's voices and lives matter. So to put our energy and the, the wonderful resources, the money that's coming from this book into fueling the development of the talent of another Black woman, whether she's a writer, a scientist, a, a botanist, we don't really care, but she's contributing to making the world a better place. So I think it's just a great honor and privilege to be part of this. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you, Thank you Margaret. It's, 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 um, it's a wonderful thing to be able to do. I got into the, the novel, uh, the anthology, because um, Myriad did um, a competition, which is the first um, novel edition, which I won. And if, without, if it wasn't for that encouragement, I would not have been in, in among such amazing writers. So to have the opportunity for somebody else to come from Africa to, to have some uh, um, training in England and to have that opportunity is absolutely wonderful. And I'm thrilled that I was, um, I'm able in my small way to make that happen. Hi, hi Margaret. Hi, Margaret. Thank you very much. Th thank you for coming to Uganda. And uh, for us, it was a great opportunity. It's very inspiring and please come again. I know we went dancing and would <laughs> like to do that again. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Gerti. And so Kiswa, and we'll end. I think it was an absolute honor to be part of this project. Uh, of course, my big fantasy is where we, all over this continent, maybe some of the money that's used um, on um, weapons that end up killing us by our governments is 
moved so that it goes to books so that more people can benefit from the scholarship like this one. So thank you very much, Margaret, for this initiative. And it was an absolute honor to be in this book. I know a lot of my writer friends who were very envious that they didn't make it. So yay, me! <laughs> can, I, can I just quickly add, although we now have two daughters of Africa, Margaret, you can't rest for more than a few more weeks. We want number three, OK? We're Absolutely. looking forward to the third volume. Yes, please. Number three, number three, number three. Number three, thank you all for your contributions this evening. Thank you. And also welcome Busby for uh, all your wonderful work. Um, we'd like, love to continue the conversation. And um, please, um, to the audience and the panelists, please continue the conversation online. And um, you can find the handles for Myriad Editions and also the British Library on Twitter, where you can continue the conversation. But thank you each for your contribution and we hope that you all start your learning with um, Daughters of Africa and have a lovely evening. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Have a good evening, everyone. Bye. 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 A huge thanks to our brilliant panel and special thanks to Myriad Editions and to the Black Curriculum. And thanks to you for joining us. Please do check out the rest of our events programme for the Unfinished Business Exhibition.